unexpected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy of every to deliver born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring by thy own eternal sufficient merit raise us to thy glorious throne good morning milton bible church good morning welcome welcome everybody so glad that you're here a lot of new faces some old new faces uh, welcome everybody um we're just here to worship god this morning amen we're, we're here to invite him in. This is our last Sunday before Christmas. Can you guys believe it? It's coming quickly. It looks like uh, there's a few people that stayed home to watch the soccer game, but that's okay. We pray for them too. <laughs> At Milton Bible Church, we really believe that the body of Christ speaks to the body of Christ and God speaks to all of us. If God has given you something to share with the church this morning, uh, a word, a song, a hymn, as it says in the New Testament, um, an encouragement, something you've learned from the Lord this week, please come and see me. I'll be right here, and we'd love to have you share at the mic. We love, the last couple of weeks, God has really been moving, and people have been sharing, and it's been such a blessing. So I encourage you, if you are a regular attender at Milton Bible Church, to come and see me, and we'd be happy to give you the microphone. Let's pray this morning as we uh, continue in worship. Jesus, we celebrate you this morning. Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our Savior. We worship you this morning as our God, as our King, as a little baby who came humbly, who came our King, who became our King through as a humble, humble servant. We thank you for that, Lord. We are eternally grateful. This morning, we just want to worship you. I just pray that right now in this moment, that we just take a moment to set our hearts towards you. Let's maybe just lay aside the busyness of the season, the thoughts of, have I got all my gifts for my family and friends? Have I done all my wrapping? Have I done all my cooking? Let's just leave that aside right now. And we're just going to spend the next hour, hour and a half worshiping you, God. We lay it at your feet. We ask Jesus that you would come in a mighty way this morning. Holy Spirit, would you touch every heart here this morning? You know how each heart needs to be touched individually and differently from one another. And I pray that nobody leaves this building today the way that they came in, that they know that they met God spirit was here. Thank you, Father. We worship you this morning as we continue to sing. Amen. Day. 
to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray.
Jesus, our, our praise shall not end through all eternity. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for meeting us here this morning. We continue to worship you as we move into a time of communion. As uh, Pastor Mark speaks to us, Lord, we remember you through all this. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for dying for us on the cross, Lord. The baby Jesus is a miraculous, miraculous birth. We thank you for that. But we also thank you for the Christ who died on the cross for each one of us. I just pray that would sink in this morning. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, he died for you. This story is not just about a cute little baby. That's part of it. It's about a king who came, sacrificed, and died for you, for you this morning. Please hear those words. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. We can please be seated. Um, I'm just going to introduce Moses. He's going to come up and lead us in um, communion. We have little communion packs. If you haven't got one yet, Sherry is standing at the back. Please go and see Sherry. Welcome, Moses. Thank you, Matt. All hail, Redeemer hail, for he died for me. <clears throat> Did you see the, the words of that message? The glory and praise shall forever be, I mean, shall be, he shall forever be praised. Um, as I walked today, as I came to church today, I, I found people putting lawn signs. And they said, and they, I mean, they were written, keep Christ in Christmas. How many of you have those, those signs, loan signs? And the, the reason for that is that we want you to remind others as well as ourselves that there's a reason for the season. As we celebrate, as we um, come together with family and friends, there's a reason for the season. And that's what we're doing with communion. We want us to remember about Christ and what he did for us on the cross. These are just elements. This is just a symbol. It's a physical, tangible reminder of what Christ did for us. And it serves as a purpose for us to remember what Christ did for us on the cross. And what a moment during the Advent to do that. Paul says clearly, in the book of First Corinthians, um, chapter twenty, um, chapter eleven, from verse twenty-three, he says, "For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you and me, so that we can have redemption." so that we can have peace, so that we can have a future in Christ. So as we remember that, as we partake of that bread, let it be a reminder of what Christ did on the cross for us. At the same way, after supper, he took the cup and says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. You know what also the Bible says? Life is in the blood. God gave us a new covenant through his blood. He shed his blood for us. So as we partake of this communion, let us remember about that covenant that Christ made with us. That we can have hope and a future because Christ did it for us. But as well, <clears throat> as, we, as this serves as a reminder as we retrospect, it's also a moment to also look at our hearts and look keenly within us and see whether we are aligned to Christ. Are we walking the walk? Have we gone astray? Do we need to come back? And I think even Christmas, that's what, you want to, what, that's what you'll do. As you sit together with family and friends, as you have best of meals together, you will remember the whole year, what was. But also you'll also take stock or take time to remember the next year. Maybe start setting your goals. Because uh, I think this is the time that you start setting 
what we need to do for next year. Um, so it's the same thing. As we remember, we also need to reproject and think about our souls, about our hearts. Are they aligned to Christ? So, so that if we are not, we are telling God, Lord, I want to align my life with yours. And that's, that's also this serves as, as a reminder and also as something else to make us look as where we are. So as I pray, I hope everybody has an element. If you don't have, our ushers will kindly uh, give somebody. If you can raise your hand, if you don't have, and our ushers will provide. There's no one. All right. And I want to pray. If you remember the time that um, at, the, at, the, at the pool of Sloam, when the angel was coming and was touching the water and, and, and was tiring the water, and everybody who goes in there was healed. I just want to pray it's the same simple message that the Holy Spirit will come to these elements. And whatever the needs are, whatever the issues are that you may be facing, if you have faith, just believe as you partake of them. And God is going to come and attend to your needs. Lord, we thank you for this, for the bread and for your blood. As we partake of them, oh God, we take them with faith and by faith. That, Lord, you're going to speak through them, O oh God, O oh Father God. May they be a place where you're going to connect with us. May you come and be with us. May we experience you in a new way, O oh Lord. May yours be done. Thank you, my Father God, for telling us to do this as often as we partake of this in your memory. And we take this in your memory in Jesus' name. So let us all open this. Take time. And take 30 seconds to reflect and also to search your heart. In Jesus' name. Um, on Christmas morning, the 25th, next Sunday, our service is online. So it'll be online at 10 o'clock. It's a short devotional, a bit, of, um, a bit of worship. So that's wonderful. If you're with family and friends on Christmas morning, you can gather around the TV. It'll be live stream. It'll be online, so it doesn't have to be right at 10 o'clock. You can start at 10, 30, 11, whatever time your kids allow you to sleep until. Apparently, I've been told we get up at 7.30, but we'll see. <laughs> Number three, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we have a NBC School of Leadership coming up in January. It's going to be an amazing, amazing 10-week um, series. So all the details that you need are in the bulletin, um, in the little insert in the bulletin. So January 10th, it begins. It goes until May 9th every second Tuesday. Um, so please take a look at that great opportunity to grow in leadership. How many people came to the Why Not Me conference? This is a great follow-up from that. Send your leaders, um, come yourself, and you will not be disappointed. Next one, I want to invite Carolyn up. Carolyn's going to tell us about an amazing event that we had last night. Holy cow, the elves are coming. <laughs> Yeah, this was thanks to the Sieben family that called me out last night for not wearing this. So I promised Rachel and, and Chelsea. Um, my name is Carolyn, and I will be changing out of this outfit after church. Um, I've been able to lead a team of uh, Food Fly volunteers for many, many years. And last evening, we had our first Christmas dinner in, uh, we called it post-COVID. So we're now calling it our first annual post-COVID event. Um, the goal of the event was to show the love of Jesus and serving um, our community, um, just being like the hands and feet. Uh, I'll share a verse at the, uh, at the end um, that came up on my Bible highlight this morning. Um, as you've heard, you know, there's always a village that um, makes uh, light work and many hands make light work. So it was like a big village that uh, we brought together for the evening last night. We had a team of over 50 volunteers, and I would be here till Christmas if I listed every single one um, that shopped, built things, um, did set up, uh, greeted, made decor, very creative, I'll mention that in a moment, um, served meals, cleaned up, and the list goes on and on. I just need to do a few key um, shout-outs here. 
Um, for anyone who doesn't know Rick Nolan, he, um, <laughs> he's a shopper extraordinaire. He's, um, he's an organizer, and he has been an amazing help to me. He shopped, he coordinated, he found a door prize um, at the last moment. Um, thank you, Rick, for all your work. Um, Matt and Donna Timpson. Uh, Matt and Donna, well, I'm surprised Matt hasn't blocked me, but that's, that's uh, next year. Um, but Matt and Donna did a lot of things behind the scene that a lot of people don't know. So I just thank you for being able to step in for us. Um, I'm going to try and get through this quick, sorry. Um, the Thomas family, who agreed to come and decorate, and I said, bring your creative skills. So the Thomas family stayed. They ended up, and they didn't leave. And all of a sudden, I saw them in, you know, serving jackets, and they had scoops in their hands. So they did every job under the sun yesterday afternoon. I was so happy for that. Um, um, oh, gosh. Okay. Making sure. Okay. Um, Bill, my husband, who loves to be in charge, uh, so... Yeah, so I gave him a job that um, he was in charge of the servers. So thank you to the servers that was under my husband's leadership and um, to the truck that I never thought I really needed. But the fact that um, that's a big blessing that we've been able to do lots of things for Food to Life because of that. So thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I said thank you to my husband. Perfect. Okay. Uh, the, we had over 25 table hosts, um, over 25 servers that helped serve food. Uh, we had a cleanup crew that came to the church, like specifically on a Saturday night at 7.30 to clean. I'm surprised they're still not sleeping here, but it, uh, there was a party here last night, and you would have not noticed it in this room. Um, to uh, Sandy Ma, who left us a few years ago, and the reason I'm mentioning Sandy is that I woke up in the evening ooh, last week and I knew I was missing something. And it was a craft table. It's, there's not an event that didn't happen where Sandy um, wasn't there. So I spoke to Chuck about this and uh, we had a craft table um, just for Sandy. So that was awesome. I'm very thankful for that. Um, to Chuck Ma, I don't know if he's still maybe sleeping back there. Um, okay. Oh, he's alive. Okay. Perfect. Um, so Chuck Ma and his team from Buchanan Technologies in the Black Bull Pub for, I have to say, precisely executing food production. That's what came to me this morning. Um, 248 pounds of turkey, 100 pounds of mashed potatoes, 44 pounds of vegetables, I'm probably missing things, uh, 80, uh, 18 pounds of uh, meatballs, a Christmas punch, stuffing, graving, the whole nine yards uh, for Christmas dinner. We had lots of desserts, uh, coffee and tea. Um, anyways, I just wanted to, if anyone's looking for any banquet needs, this, the Chuck Ma of catering will be taking bookings in 2024. Um, thank you, Chuck. Uh, although the numbers were less than we had anticipated and expected, um, I believe our goal to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to show his love was achieved. We were all able to invite people to Christmas Eve service um, with new conversations and sharing of stories. Oh, I knew I forgot one group. I'm really sorry. The Milton Christian School um, kids came and set up on Friday morning, so we're very thankful to them. Oh, there we go. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in my daily, um, the highlight of my, my Bible app, this is what came up this morning. I'll just take one moment to read it. Um, and I thought it, it really encompassed everything that we um, hoped to achieve last evening. And it talks a lot about God's love and loving one another. And if God loved us so much and put so much into us, we are to uh, show that love and focus to others. So it came from um, 1 John 4, 16 to 17. And it says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in um, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Um, yeah, I, um, anyways, I just wanted to just thank you again. And uh, 
I hope that we have some people um, here on Christmas Eve that were blessed last evening. I think that would just be an amazing accomplishment. So um, thank you, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Stay here, thank you, Carolyn. Last night she promised me she wouldn't cry, so you did not keep your promise. <laughs> Carolyn is the epitome of a servant leader, I think. She will constantly point to others and what they have done, but all the areas she just talked about were all under her leadership, plus she does this every Thursday. So I think I actually think it would be appropriate if we wanted to stand up and thank Carolyn for all that she's done. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. And I know she does it in the name of Jesus. That's the whole point. Let's continue to pray, as she said. Folks from our community will be here on Christmas Eve. Our last announcement, we, as you know, we have a Christmas offering coming up. We have a special video, if Heather Ann, you wouldn't mind running that. Greetings, Milton Bible Church family. Greetings, pastors, Jim, Mark, the leadership team. Uh, as a family, Rula, uh, Robin, Jonathan, our kids, we're sending you our greetings during uh, Christmas uh, season, where we are celebrating together the peace, love, joy, and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I do believe, we do believe that this season is a great season to remember the great need uh, for the gospel. Uh, to break through and to reach out among the Arab and Islamic communities uh, where we are living today. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you know that just in GTA area and Milton area, there is 750,000 Arab and Islamic people living in this area, and they are in a great need uh, for the gospel. They are in a great need to celebrate Jesus as we are celebrating. For that reason, we're sending uh, this video to encourage you, dear beloveds, to pray more for the potential church planting ministry that we are preparing with the leadership team. And um, uh, to pray also and give in generous way uh, for the project of sponsoring uh, a church planter uh, refugee with his family uh, in order to help them to come and to plant an Arabic church in order to reach out uh, the area by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of hope, the gospel of joy, the gospel of, of peace and love. So please pray about it. And uh, we are praying with you because we are witnessing that our model to plant an Arabic church, the new model under the seven principles, is working in a great way in couple churches uh, across the area. And we are witnessing uh, many people coming to Christ and celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ. We would like uh, to praise the Lord with you for all what you are doing, dear brothers and, uh, and sisters. And in the same time, uh, we are looking forward to see uh, the Lord's hand working through Milton Bible Church uh, in order to see his glory and the Bible and the gospel by his grace break through among the nations in your community and beyond. As a family, Again, Rula, Rob, and myself would like to thank you very much for your prayers, for your generous support, and uh, we would like to say that with you, uh, dear beloveds, we are able to do what we are doing in Canada and beyond for God's glory. Merry Christmas, and God bless you abundantly. Check, check. There we go. Many of you may know Bashara. Bashara is one of our uh, mission partners here at Milton Bible Church. And um, Bashara prepared that video to just give us a quick update and a little more insight into our Christmas Challenge project. Our Christmas Challenge project is that we would bring over an Arabic-speaking church planter to Canada in order to establish a gospel mission, a church here in Canada. Whether that's in Milton, whether that's somewhere else, we don't know yet. We'll still discern that. But we're excited about the opportunity ahead of us. Just a quick update on the Christmas Challenge. You can, as Matt said, you can give using these Christmas Challenge envelopes. Envelopes. You could give this morning um, just outside the doors there. Um, but we have started to see some money rolling in. We have an ambitious number of 140,000 uh, that will support this church planner and his family uh, as they come over as refugees for two years. 
Um, and the number we have, I think it's a number that uh, will still really encourage us to realize that the need is there and that um, there's a ways to go. So far, we've raised about $10,000 towards this initiative. I think we can clap to that and we can praise God for all that's been given. Yep. But as you can see with that number, there's still a ways to go. Now, we've only got this in front of you as a congregation over the last two or three weeks. We're only about halfway through December. So as Matt mentioned, you can continue to give to this project. You can give online to the Christmas challenge. You can give on Sunday morning today. But just because of the nature of how it shakes out, uh, we will not take any offerings on Christmas Eve because we have so much of our community coming and loved ones. We'll have an online service Christmas Day. And then believe it or not, we'll be hitting New Year's Day, January 1st. So if you are looking to give within this year, uh, we encourage you, if you can't do it today, either do it online or come into the church through the week and uh, you can meet with our team here and we can make sure all of your offerings for this project get to it. Sound good, church? All right. God's good. Let's continue to give towards this. And I'm excited. I'm really excited to see what the Lord has in store in the years to come through this specific initiative. I'm going to turn it back to Matt. Thank you, Mark. Very exciting. Let's pray for the kids, Power Kids. Um, you can, after we pray, you can head out to your class. Um, Tori Cochran is there, and she will lead you to your classrooms. Father, thank you again for the moving of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for each and every child that's here this morning as they head off to their Power Kids class. Lord, would you bless them? Would you meet them? Would you encourage them? Would they have fun with each other? And would they meet you, the Holy God? our holy God, this morning um, as they go to their Power Kids program. Thank you for each one of them and for each teacher. Amen. Amen. Okay, kids, you can head out. The rest of you, let's just take two minutes, stand up and stretch. Turn to someone beside you and say, have you bought a gift for Matt Timpson yet? Good morning, Milton Bible Church. Just one week until Christmas. One week until Christmas. Who's got all their shopping done? All right, I see a few people. Who here is panicking as we speak, thinking about all the shopping they need to do? All right, that's good, that's good. And the rest of us are somewhere in between, but that's okay. Well, we've been doing this series called A Christmas Visit. You know, I love that video because it just reminds us of maybe some of the feelings and the things that we do in this season as we prepare to visit others. We prepare to visit relatives, family, friends. We visit church. We visit colleagues. Uh, so many visits that happen in this Christmas season. And what we decided to do this year was to look at the Christmas story in the scriptures from the perspective of the many visits that would happen the many visits that happened, the angel visiting Mary, Mary visiting Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph visiting Bethlehem, the angels visit the shepherds, the shepherds visit the baby Jesus, the magi visits the baby Jesus. And today, we're going to be looking at what we're calling the greatest visit, the greatest visit. What's the greatest visit that you've ever had? What is the greatest visit you've ever had? Maybe it was a person, maybe it was a place. I was thinking about this, and I was reminded about a great visit that I had a number of years ago. Maybe not the greatest visit out of all the visits of my life, but it was a great one. You see, about 15 years ago, my middle brother, Scott, he used to do reviews on Xbox video games for a website that was online. And it was a good deal. He didn't get paid for it, but they'd send him video games, and he got to play them, write a review, and he got to keep them. But once in a while, a video game company would reach out to him uh, and many of these review sites and say, hey, we want to bring one of your reviewers out to California, and we're going to, it's an all-expense paid trip, we're going to show you a good time, you get to test the video game, we'll have some fun stuff for you, and then we'll fly you back home a couple days later. And lo and behold, my brother Scott, he couldn't go. 
So he called me up and said, Mark, I have this opportunity to go and review a video game in California I can't go. Would you like to go and make that visit on my behalf? And I said, yes, Scott, yes, I would. <laughs> so I boarded an airplane heading out to California to review the video game, WWE Legends of WrestleMania, all right? <laughs> Got out there, flew in, landed in California. The first thing, I've never had this in my life, probably will never have it again. I'm coming down an escalator in, I don't know, is it LAX or whatever out there? And there's a guy standing there, well-dressed, holding a sign that says Strickland. Strickland, that's right. I'm like, oh, that's for me. I'm the guy. And uh, it turns out that was my limo driver, and he took me on a limo drive. It was about an hour outside of LA. And guess what? He, when Beyonce's in town, he is Beyonce's limo driver. So, I mean, I thought if this is good enough for Beyonce, it's good enough for Mark Strickland, right? Uh, what a great visit. So, headed out to uh, THQ headquarters or whatever the company was called, you know, stayed the night, met some of the other reviewers. The next day, they kept hinting, there's a special in store for you tomorrow. So, we got to the boardroom of the video game places um, um, headquarters, and they said to us, we have a special guest who's going to help us review the game and see it today. And that was the day that I had one of the greatest visits of my life, I met Sergeant Slaughter. Sergeant Slaughter from WrestleMania, WWE. Here it is. Yep, I had hair back then, believe it or not. And that's me and Sergeant Slaughter in one of the greatest visits of my life. You know, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? Well, I don't know if it's the greatest visit of my life, but it certainly was a great visit and a fun opportunity. What about you? What are some of the greatest visits that you've ever had? What are some of the greatest visits you've ever had? Was it a place? Was it Disneyland, the happiest place on earth? Was it a special cruise? Was it a return maybe home to your country of origin? Maybe uh, the greatest visit was a person. Maybe it was a, a lost relative that you reconnected with. Maybe it was a person that you admire, that you've always wanted to meet, and then you had that opportunity. Or maybe it was the birth of a child or a grandchild, the greatest visit. Listen, as great as all these visits and trips are, as great as it was for me to meet Sergeant Slaughter and be driven around by Beyonce's limo driver, all of these visits pale in comparison to the greatest visit, the greatest visit. This is where we're going today. Jesus coming to earth. Jesus coming to earth is the greatest visit in human history. Jesus coming to earth is the greatest visit in human history. Now, I know many of us, we know this truth in our head. Many of us are already followers of Jesus. But in this Christmas season, do you know it in your heart? Do you feel it in your heart? Has it moved from your head to your heart today? Well, this morning we're going to be looking at this truth about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 9, 1 to 7. If you have a Bible, physical or digital, I'd invite you to open up to Isaiah 9. And while you're going there, I'll give you a little context on this passage. The book of Isaiah was written around 700 B.C. I mean, Christmas is when we celebrate Jesus. We're going to be looking at a passage written 700 years before Jesus was even born in this Christmas visit message. The context of this passage is this. In chapter 8, the chapter before, we see that Isaiah is writing about the state of the Israelites. And things aren't going very well for the Israelites. You see, they've turned away from God. They've turned to uh, the things of the peoples and the groups around them. It's a bleak, it's a dark place. The scripture says that they're turning to mediums and necromancy. Mediums and necromancy. But it's at this point in the book of Isaiah that Isaiah busts out uh, what Jewish and Christian theologians unanimously consider a messianic prophecy, a prophecy about one who was to come and bring hope. And it's into this context that we dig in to verses 1, and we'll read through to 5. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee, and the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. 
for every boot of the trampling warrior in battle to malt, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. We're going to stop there, and we'll continue on in a minute. The first thing that I see when I read this passage is this. Jesus was and is the greatest expectation humanity has ever known. Jesus was and is the greatest expectation humanity has ever known. We all love expectation and hype, don't we? Don't you love expectation and hype? Uh, It took James Cameron, the filmmaker, 13 years to make a sequel to his hit Avatar. I remember 13 years ago, probably around the time that picture was taken when I had hair, I went to see Avatar and I thought, this is one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. And I heard a sequel was coming and I thought, that's great. Maybe next Christmas or the Christmas after, my brothers and I will go and watch it. That'll be exciting. And we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited. Yet this weekend, Avatar, the sequel, was released. I was reading a review in the Washington Post, and here's what one reviewer says. This is hype. Why go to the cinema when you can stream movies at home? That's the question. Do you know the answer? Three-dimensional battle whales. That's why. That's why. I mean, if that doesn't bring the hype and sell it, I don't know what does. I can see some of your faces. You're like, that did not bring the hype for me, Pastor Mark. But anyhow... We love hype and expectation. Uh, World Cup final. I mean, it's literally starting right now. I know some of you are checking your phones, and uh, that's okay. Try and stay with me for the next 15 minutes, okay? But France and Argentina, World Cup only comes around once every four years. And for all the soccer fans in the room, I know there's two seasons you live in. There's World Cup season, and that's about a month of the, of the four-year cycle. And then there's the expectation for World Cup season, which takes up the other three years and 11 months, right? We love the expectation and the hype. We didn't make it this year, our team, but maybe next year. The expectation and hype begins tomorrow for the next World Cup. I know for my wife and daughters, uh, they love it when I share stories about them on Sunday morning, but every year they wait in expectation in October for the Hallmark Christmas movie season, right? And it launches into full effect in October. Hey, I know lots of us, you know what? I'm guilty of watching a few Hallmark Christmas movies, and I used to make fun of them, but I don't mind them. They're kind of, they have a charm to them, you know? But we wait in expectation for the things that we are expectant for, that we're excited for. Well, I want to tell you something. Jesus' birth was the greatest expectation that humanity has ever known. Did you know that Jesus' life alone, he has conservatively fulfilled 300 prophecies from the Old Testament? 300 prophecies across thousands of years, multiple authors, specific things about his birth. Here's just a few. Isaiah 7.14 says there'll be a virgin birth, fulfilled in Matthew. Micah 5.2 says Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, fulfilled in Luke. Hosea 11, 1 says that he would come out of Egypt, which happened because he, uh, his parents fled from Herod and only came back from Egypt when Herod had died. Numbers 24 tells us there would be a Christmas star. Genesis 3.15 is called the first prophecy of the coming Redeemer, promising a Redeemer who would come and crush the serpent's head. Genesis 12.3, God promises to Abraham that through your seed, through your children, they would, there would be a blessing, not just for your family, not just for your people, but a blessing to the nations. There was a hype and an expectation about the coming Messiah who would visit the people. And the people wondered, and they waited, when will it be? When will the Messiah come? And Isaiah writes in 9 verse 1, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Where was the land of Zebulon and Naphtali? Well, I have a picture here, and I'll show you exactly where it is. These were um, areas of the the Israelites when they came into the promised land. They marked them out. You can see Zebulon and uh, Naphtali there. And I've circled a spot on that map on the left. And if you look at the one on the right, it's a map from the time of Jesus. That's the region of Galilee. And you'll notice that exactly along the border of Zebulon and Naphtali, there's a little town called Nazareth. There's a little town called Nazareth. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah said, from this region, from this border, from this area, Nazareth, 
the Messiah would come. What's more, the way of the sea, it's not just a poetic way of saying, you know, the way of the sea, but it was actually like saying, you know, by the 401 is, how, is, is around where this region was. The way of the sea was the only way that people outside of Israel coming from the north, so Gentiles, outsiders, all people, whether it was visitors or invading armies, they would have to come through the way of the sea, through Galilee, into Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, what are the odds? Born in a place located between Zebulun and Naphtali, that that's where the Messiah would come from. It doesn't get more specific about than that, does it? The scripture goes on to say, The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Isn't this verse your testimony? Isn't this verse your testimony? Think back to that moment when you realized you were trying to do it on your own. Maybe you weren't into mediums and necromancy as the ancient Israelites were, but you had your thing. Chasing wealth, chasing material possessions, prestige, experiences, chasing relationships, maybe drugs or alcohol or whatever it was. We all had our thing. We were walking in darkness And then into that darkness, a great light named Jesus invaded your life. He shone on you. And your life was forever changed for the better. The emptiness of those things was replaced by the love and the peace and the hope of Christ. This verse is a portrait of your testimony, of my testimony, and it was a prophecy of a coming Messiah. I love this line here in in these verses we read. The rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. What's he getting at here? Well, the day of Midian is a reference to Gideon. Do you remember Gideon's fleece, maybe from Sunday school? You know, he puts the fleece out, it's wet, puts it out, it's dry, all these crazy things. And ultimately, God calls Gideon to raise up an army to fight against the mighty Midianites who had thousands among their number. And Gideon, he goes out to do this. And along the way, God says, Gideon, get rid of a few of your army members. Gideon, get rid of a few more. Gideon, a few more, a few more until Gideon is whittled down to 300 Israelites against a mighty army of Midianites. And yet they're faithful to what God's called them to. They light their torches, they blow their trumpets, and they invade the Midianite camp, and they embark on what becomes an unexpected and surprising victory. It's a surprising victory. You know, it reminds me of the Messiah, Jesus, our humble Messiah, who would defeat the darkness. The darkness was great. He would defeat our sin. He would defeat our shame in a surprising and unexpected victory. You might say that the coming Messiah was the most unexpected, expected thing that could ever happen. He came not as a warrior, but as a child and as a servant. And on the the cross, he triumphed over the power of Satan. Jesus coming to earth is the greatest visit in human history. There was expectation around his coming, and he delivered on every prophecy, on every point. He perfectly fulfilled the prophetic expectation that was before him. Well, the second thing we see in this passage, it's, uh, it's this one. And we're going to read, uh, it's, actually, I'll say this. Jesus was the greatest person. I want to read verse 6, and I love this verse so much, I thought it'd be fun if we could read it together. So I've put it on the screen here. That Jesus is the greatest person, but we'll put it on the screen. And let's go ahead and read together. Here we go. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. I don't know if any of you watched the Olympics, but I love the Olympics. I love getting to know the athletes that are representing us as Canadians. And I know for many of us, you're lucky because maybe you cheer for two countries. You cheer for the country you were born in and you cheer for Canada. And that's pretty cool. But when we think of our athletes, we think of them as being our sons and our daughters, going out on the world stage and representing all of us. They're our sons, they're our daughters, and their medals are are for Canada's people. It's into this kind of mindset that Isaiah declares, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. You know, in other passages in Scripture, uh, God or the Scriptures say to Abraham and Sarah a child is born, or to a specific parent a child is born. 
But in Isaiah, he says, to us, a son is born. To us, all of us, a child's given. This child, the Messiah, he would be a person who would hail from a specific region in Galilee. He would be a son that would stand for all of us on the world stage. Many scholars also say this stanza speaks to the humanity of Jesus. A child of man was born. A son of God is given. The humanity and the divinity of Jesus. The scripture says the government will be upon his shoulder. The government will be upon his shoulder. I used to think that this meant like the Roman army and the Jewish Sanhedrin would be chasing after him and he'd be looking over his shoulder like, get away from me. That's not what it means at all, okay? That's not what it means. What it's talking about when the government is upon his shoulder is that the perfect rule and reign of God would be upon him. When we do it on our own strength, we do it under sin, under brokenness, under darkness, but Jesus would take the perfect rule of God and bear it on himself. Let me try and explain this. A few years ago, when I was a teenager, I, was, uh, I led the youth worship band in my high school, in my last year of high school. Believe it or not, you would not want to hear me lead worship today, but back then I thought I could do it, and I did do it for a season, and it was okay. But anyhow, in my grade 12 year, it was not okay. It was horrible, and I'll tell you why it was horrible, because I didn't really lead very well. I always had excuses for why it wasn't going well. I remember one time one of my mentor leaders who was older than me came to me and said, Mark, this thing is not going well under your leadership. It's really bad. And I would say, well, I, I, I asked the person three weeks ago if they would play, and then they didn't show up, so it's their fault. I asked someone to photocopy those sheets, and they didn't photocopy them, so it's their fault. Uh, I thought my parents could give me a ride, but they couldn't, so I just didn't show up. So that's my parents' fault. And this mentor of mine said to me, said, Mark... When you're the leader, everything falls on your shoulders. You're responsible. I'll never forget that. It changed my life and it changed the way I approached leadership. Jesus steps into humanity. He does what only God could do. He bears the government and the responsibility upon himself. He's our son, representing us on the world stage. Now we get four names for Jesus. These weren't meant to be given names, but they tell us about who Jesus was like. The first one is Wonderful Counselor. Peleotes. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Wonderful Counselor. Uh, they, they tell us, the scholars, that when you actually look at this word wonderful, it's better translated wonder. Jesus is the Wonder Counselor. The Wonder Counselor. And doesn't that describe who the Messiah would be? Jesus comes to earth miraculously through a virgin birth, the wonder counselor. He comes to lead us uh, and teach us the way to live, to be our great counselor. You know, he literally says at the end of his life, go and teach the things I've told you. Throughout his life, he performs works of wonder. He heals. He casts people, demons out of people. He literally dies on the cross and rises again. It's witnessed by hundreds of people. Live the life of wonder, but more so, if you follow Christ, haven't you experienced his wonder in your life? When you've been praying around something and God miraculously shows up, maybe it's a healing or something like that. Maybe it's uh, just uh, an assurance of something and God shows up in just the right moment. Have you seen the wonder counselor show up in your life? The scripture says that uh, another name that he would have is the mighty God, El Gabor. This one's really cool because Mighty God is actually a proper name for God that's used elsewhere in the Old Testament. And Isaiah's literally saying, this coming Messiah, this child that would be born, the Son of God that's coming, he will be God. He will be a mighty God. He is literally God in flesh coming to earth. It's told right here, 700 years before Jesus is born, that the greatest visit in human history would be from God. The next title, Everlasting Father, Abiyad. Another way to say this is Father of Eternity. What this isn't saying is that Jesus is exactly the Father, okay? They're God the Father, Holy Spirit, Son of God are all different. But what they're saying is he will have a, a paternity about him, a paternity for humanity that is like a father, that he would be an everlasting one. This is another reference to deity. In Hebrews, uh, the scripture tells us, Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
In John 1, the scripture says, in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him. Jesus would be the Father of eternity, yesterday, today, and forever. And the last name given in this prophetic uh, passage is the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Now, I don't think the English word peace really does justice to the word shalom. Shalom wasn't just peace. It wasn't just like there was war going on, the war stopped, and now we're in a time of peace. Shalom had a deeper meaning. It's like all is right in the world. It's like this sense of being in harmony with God and creation. It's reconciliation with those who you have broken relationships with. It's a sense that justice has been served, that those who have need, those needs are met. It's a deep sense of all being right. I don't know if we always live in shalom, but I know as believers, I know in my life and in many testimonies I hear, whether it's at a moment of salvation, whether it's at a moment of brokenness, sometimes the Lord embeds in us just this deep sense of shalom. I'm with you, my child. All is right in the world. I'm with you. And the scripture says the Messiah, the one who would bear the government on his shoulders, he would be the prince of shalom. He would be the prince of reconciliation. He would be the prince of bringing all that would be right to the world. The leading figure of shalom, of peace for humanity. There's no question, Jesus is and was the greatest person who ever lived. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Jesus is our favored son. He's the one who represents all of us. The government, the perfect rule of God is on his shoulders. And it's for that reason that Jesus is our greatest hope. He's our greatest hope. Let's read verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth, and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do it. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but until the child Messiah Jesus came, Satan thought he was winning. Maybe you could say Satan was winning before Jesus came. I mean, after Adam and Eve, humanity got so wicked and broken that God had to reset it with a flood. And even after the time of Noah, Humanity again got so wicked, they tried to build a Tower of Babel to try and be like God, to get to God, that God had to destroy it, confuse the languages, and separate people. The condition of our human heart without God is that we're broken. We have a disease called sin. And it's this person, Jesus, who brought a great and unexpected hope to humanity. I believe that Satan foresaw there would be a Messiah coming, and I, I suspect that he had no idea what was coming. He probably thought there's a mighty warrior that's coming. Or maybe he thought, maybe God will send an angelic uh, Messiah, some angel or something. And even some cults and stuff believe that about Jesus, which is incorrect, okay? Uh, maybe uh, Satan thought, there's going to be a ruler that comes along, who's a human ruler, who's going to be that coming Messiah. I don't think in a million years, Satan expected God to come in the form of a baby, born to parents of a lower class, raised in Galilee, a backwater town of Israel. A baby that would grow to be a man of little means, who had no earthly possessions, a man who taught us the depths of love, not to fight, not to hate, not to rule by the throne. Rather, he taught us to love one another, to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, to put others ahead of ourselves, to stand up for justice and live a life of sacrifice. For our Messiah Jesus, that life of sacrifice led him to the cross. I think Satan thought he won in that moment. He thought he won. That was until our Jesus, our son who was born, our guy, our God. He stood in the literal space of hell and declared, Surprise! The depths of hell and death are neither for me, nor can they hold me, and they will certainly not contain me, because guess what? I've got the keys. I got the keys. I won the Olympic gold. Jesus did what we could not do because he was God. He defeated death. And as God, he offers us peace and a hope 
that the gates of hell cannot prevail over. Amen? Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. That's the gospel. That's redemption. That's hope. And guess what? If you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're under his rule. You're under his government. You're under his calling to redemption, and you get to be a part of bringing that redemption to our world. Isn't that the coolest thing that we could ever be a part of? I love it. Jesus is our greatest hope. I'm going to invite our worship band to come up as we're going to be wrapping up in just a minute. Jesus coming to earth is the greatest visit in human history. We know it in our head, but do we know it in our heart? Do we feel it in our heart? Uh, Back in the summer, a friend of mine who was a former colleague, a pastor friend um, at a previous church, I reached out to him and we were chatting, and then he ghosted me unexpectedly. Have you ever been ghosted by someone? I didn't think too much of it. I mean, we kind of had that relationship. But um, he reached out to me again about six, six weeks ago. And he said, Mark, I'm so sorry that I bailed on you, um, you know, in the middle of the summer in our conversation. He said, I didn't have the words to say at the time, but he's, he said, as you know, my father and I, we have an estranged relationship. And he said, around the time we were chatting, my father reached out to me. And he said, son, he said, uh, I don't think I have long for this world. I'm seriously ill. And I'd really like to see you. I'd like to see your family. And so my friend, he went embarked on what was perhaps one of the greatest visits of his life. He went back to his home in Ghana, where uh, he was born and raised. And um, he went to go meet with his father. And he sat down with his father. And his father said, son, he said, I'm so sorry for what happened. I'm so sorry for how I treated you, your brothers and sisters, your mother. He said, I can't undo the past. I only have a week or so left of life but I'm here asking and begging for your forgiveness. I'm asking for reconciliation. And my friend, he accepted that offer for forgiveness and reconciliation, and they reconciled. And this grandfather got to meet his grandchild. He got to meet his daughter-in-law. And sadly, just a couple weeks later, he passed away. For my friend, that trip home to see his father in Ghana, it might have been one of the greatest visits of his life. It was a visit of reconciliation. It was a visit of hope. But that visit would never have been possible had it not been for the greatest visit humanity has ever known, the visit of the Christ child. When Jesus came to earth, it was a visit of reconciliation, not just between two people. It was a visit that reconciled humanity to God. We know it in our heads. Are we feeling it in our hearts? In terms of next steps from today's message, where do you go from this? How do you apply a message like this? You know, for some of us, perhaps the greatest encouragement today is the expected visit. Maybe there's times where we go through doubts in our faith and we're like, yeah, is it? Is it not? And you go, you know what? 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. I mean, if I dug in my backyard and found a book and it had 300 specific prophecies about my life, where I'd live, what I'd do for a living, how I'd die, I'd be like, that's crazy. But God did it. God did it. Maybe that's the encouragement you need to hear today. Maybe for some of us, we're living in darkness. And suddenly you hear those words, there's been a great light. A light that's breaking through. And maybe the next step for you today is say, man, I've been living under the government of my own mind, of my own actions, of my own life and wants and wills. But today, I need the hope of Jesus. Our son, our child that was given And maybe today, the encouragement is to give your life to Christ for the first time. Maybe it's for the second time. Maybe it's for the 80th time. I don't know, okay? But all I know is that God wants to break through in your life. That's what Jesus coming to earth is all about. That's what the light shining in the darkness is all about. God doesn't want you to live in darkness. Would you live under his rule, under his reign today? And for many of us, would we experience the shalom that God has for us, the hope that God has for us? Would we get on board with the redemptive mission that God's called us to in the days ahead? I mean, Christmas Eve, we got a chance to start a little spark of that, inviting our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors out for Christmas Eve service. You got to start somewhere, right? Why not start with Christmas Eve, the one time when many people will come out to church? I don't know. Jesus came to earth to institute a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of shalom, 
All things will be brought into this shalom. All things will be made right and restored. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on him a light is shone. Allow me to pray for us today. Father God, we're just so thankful, Lord, that you love us. We, thank, we are thankful for you, Jesus. We love all the visits of the Christmas story, God, and how you just show up in these unique ways and speak to people, Lord, and um, we can learn great truths from those accounts in Scripture, Lord. But the greatest story, the greatest news the world has ever known was your birth, Jesus. We thank you for guiding Isaiah 700 years ago to write this prophetic passage that would speak truth about who you are. Jesus, we're thankful that you came to this earth, that you came not as a mighty warrior, not as a ruler, but in the form of a baby. You lived a perfect life, a humble life, the life of a servant, and ultimately you died for our sins and rose again. Jesus, may we join you in the mission of redemption. Jesus, may we experience the shalom that you have for us. God, may we know it in our hearts and not just in our heads. It's in your name we pray, oh Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, stand up and sing uh, the Christmas song, How Great Is Our God. It's, uh, you know, I mean, Christmas time, we're thinking about the baby, right? But... Uh, you know, the angels come before him and say, glory to God in the highest and, and, and on earth peace among you know, men with whom he is pleased, right? This Jesus, his baby is the, the wonder counsel, right? Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And, uh, you know, that's who we're, we're praising, we're worshiping.
is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. God, you are great. You are amazing, God. You are the greatest visit, Jesus. You are the greatest person. We just worship you this morning. Thank you, Father. I pray this week as we go through the busyness of this upcoming week, as we prepare for Christmas, we will not forget this. Father, we pray, I pray right now, Lord, we declare in your name that on Christmas Eve, there will be hundreds of people here. People. People who don't know you, who need your love. Come, Jesus. Amen. Just as we close our service, we're going to have two prayer teams, myself and Donna on this side, Mary and Pat on this side. Lori is going to be in the front here. You can come and see Lori and she will direct you. Come and get prayer for anything. You know, I really feel God has told me something this morning. A lot of you might know I have Tourette's syndrome. A verse that is really important to me, I've always thought of, is be still and know that I am God. I physically cannot be still. But I feel like so God is saying to someone here this morning, be still metaphorically, spiritually, be still and know that I am God. Maybe that's for the first time. Maybe that's coming back to him and being filled with his spirit. If God is speaking that to you today, please come forward for prayer. Please come forward. Thank you, folks. Have a great day. Have a great week. Merry Christmas, all. We will see you on Christmas Eve.